Well, today we continue our journey through the book of 1 Corinthians. In fact, we find ourselves right in the middle of chapter 6. And as we do that, if you're new with us, I, I need to explain to you that our habit is to simply take a Bible book and preach clear through it, which means I'm going to tackle the easy stuff, I'm going to tackle the hard stuff. And this is one of those hard passages. In fact, we're going to talk about the S word today. We're going to talk about sex. And my purpose in this message, and I've got to give you a couple of warnings. First of all, my purpose is not to make you uncomfortable or make you squirm. That's not my intent, although it may happen. But I want you to know as we preach about this passage, I do so because I care about you and your life, because God cares about you and your life. And so this is a tough passage. I'm excited because if you'll just hang with me, as we get to the end of this passage, you're going to realize that what God wants to do is offer us forgiveness, from no matter who we are or what we've done. And so we'll get there, but at first it may be uncomfortable. The second warning I want to give you before we jump into our passage is this. This sermon will not be culturally popular. In fact, it will be counterculture. Let me say that a different, different way. I don't know anywhere else where you're going to hear a message like this. You're certainly not going to hear it on the TV screens or at the movie theater. You're not going to hear it in public squares. Because, again, it goes counterculture. Sexual freedom is among the highest ranking values in the world in which we live. And so this will be counterculture. Don't believe me? Well, I can give you a few examples. I know you know it's true, but here's some examples. Here's what you're going to hear in our culture around us. It's my life. I'm going to do what I please. I mean, after all, not hurting anyone, we're, we're consenting adults, right? You'll hear things like this. What happens in your private life? Well, it's not your business. It's our business. Or you'll hear this sometimes. Don't put your old-fashioned values on me. Well, before we go on, I've, I've got to stop and say that last one's kind of curious. Actually, when Paul writes this letter, he writes to a culture that was probably even more promiscuous than ours. He writes to a culture, Corinth. In Corinth, if you were the citizen of the month, you earned your way up to the top of the mountain where there was a, well, there was a place of worship there where there were a thousand prostitutes, and that was part of their worship. And so when Paul writes this, he actually writes to a culture that was, again, more promiscuous than even our own. And so this thought that, okay, we're putting old-fashioned values on people, well, that's just not true. But again, we live in a society that boasts about its sexualness, its sexuality, not unlike Corinth. See, the church there also lived in a, a situation where they glorified sexual immorality. They even had a word, and we've talked about this before, Corinth was so bad, so far gone, they even coined a verb for that kind of lifestyle. They called it Corinthianizing. And so if somebody was Corinthianizing, well, that's the kind of lifestyle they were living. And so it was a problem then. What was worse is that same attitude had infiltrated the church. And the church was making all kinds of excuses about why they could live this way. And so as we look at this passage, we've got to stop and say, this is a passage that our culture needs to hear, and you probably won't hear it anywhere else. The truth of the matter is, in our own culture, I'm actually shocked about how fast our morals and values have changed, even the last eight or ten years, how things that used to be wrong are now considered right, and we've seen a downward spiral in our country. Is that, that true or not? Anybody else seen that? This passage is going to deal that with that directly. And so I'm shocked about how quickly our own country has moved. I'm more shocked about how the church has adopted the world's practices, and even the church is making excuses about those type of things. And I've got to say, in that area, we're not unlike the church in Corinth. You see, the church in Corinth, even the church in Corinth was clever about coming up with good reasons for doing bad things and living an alternate lifestyle. In fact, when we get to our passage, Paul is even going to quote what they were saying about their own faith. And when we get down to verse 12, we'll read it in a moment, but in verse 12, he, he quotes a popular saying of the day. They were saying this, all things are lawful for me. And so even the church was saying, look, it's okay, it's legal. It's okay for me to, to participate in these kind of things. All things are lawful for me. I like the way the New Living Translation puts that. I'm allowed to do anything. In fact, the church was saying that. In fact, as they were making excuses, they were clever about coming up with good excuses. They actually came up with a couple arguments, and one of those was a theological argument about, look, it's okay for us to, uh, to do these things because we've been forgiven. So they had this theological argument for their sin. 
And the argument was this, we're free in Christ Jesus. In fact, they even used Paul's own words against him. Paul, you're the one that told us we were free in Christ. Because Paul has written, for freedom Christ has set us free. You're called to freedom, brother. So Paul, look, you told us we're free. Or Paul said things like this, we're under grace, not law. For sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law, but under grace. Or Paul said elsewhere in Ephesians, we're saved by grace through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it's the gift of God. You're saved by grace, and so it doesn't matter what you do. Don't you realize that Jesus Christ has forgiven us, and so we can live however we want to live. And so they actually had a theological reason. Look, we can go out and live a sexual permissive lifestyle because we know we've been forgiven in Jesus. And they used Paul's own words against him. Well, I've got to stop and remind you, well, Paul told us not to use grace as an excuse to sin. He writes elsewhere in Romans chapter 6, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Literally in Greek it says this. Shall we continue in sin so grace can increase? Not. That's what it says. It's menega no. No. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so Paul says, look, don't use grace, don't use forgiveness as an excuse to sin more. But the church in Corinth, they were doing exactly that. They were using freedom in Christ as an excuse to continue to sin. Well, they didn't only have a theological argument, they also had a philosophical argument. Again, Paul quotes one of their sayings, and they were saying this, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. What they were doing is using a philosophical argument of the day. It really came from Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy said, well, the body itself is evil. And so you can't help that. You just need to indulge the the cravings of your body. And so everything, including the body, was, uh, well, everything, the, the physical body was evil. And so things done by the body didn't matter. And so their argument was, look, food's food. The stomach's the stomach. Sex is sex. Sex is just a biological function, and sex is just like food. So if you get hungry, what do you do? You eat to fulfill that craving. Well, sex is no different. So they use this philosophical argument to say, look, we're just following the the desires of our body, and it's just natural, and so it's okay. And so they use these arguments, the philosophical argument and the theological argument to say, it's okay how we live, and nobody should tell us how 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 to live, and what we do, well, that doesn't really matter. And they used these as an excuse to sin. See, the church back then struggled to break free from the world's ways. I'm going to suggest to you things today aren't any different, are they? That, that people use excuses to try to justify their sin. And this is one of those areas it's hard because our country, our nation, this is among one of the highest ranking values, sexual freedom. It's our life, it's our body, we're going to do what we please. Well, Paul writes in a very similar situation, and I want you to notice what he writes. And so if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want you to notice what he writes as we get down to chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful to me. That's their argument. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Again, he quotes them, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body's not meant for sexual morality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who's joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it's written, the two will become one flesh, quoting the Old Testament. But he who's joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that the body is the the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Paul is going to give some arguments here. In fact, in our passage, Paul is going to show three dangers of sexual sin. And to give you a preview of where we're going... He's going to say sexual sin actually harms everyone involved, and it goes beyond that. More than that, it gains control over people who practice that, and it disrupts God's purposes in your life. And so he's going to lay out arguments why 
we should be sexually pure. And again, I want to stop and say this is a needed message, and I want my kids to hear this, and someday my grandkids to hear this. I'm going to suggest to you that nobody else in society is going to give this kind of message. The kids aren't going to hear it in the, in the public school system. They're not going to see it on TV. Somebody needs to stand up and say there is something that's right and there is wrong. And I also want to tell you God actually gives us rules for living, not because he's a cosmic killjoy, but because he wants us to experience life as it was intended. And so he's going to warn about the dangers of sexual sin and give us three of those arguments. And the first argument is this. Sin, especially sexual sin, sin's harmful. And you know that. He writes in his passage, again, he's quoting their argument, all things are lawful for me. But Paul goes and says, but not all things are helpful. And just to remind you, while Jesus forgives sin, Jesus certainly forgives sin, no sin ever produces anything that's good or right. Sin is never worthwhile or profitable or helpful. And that's the word Paul uses here. I want to look at that word helpful here. It literally means to bring together, but it has this meaning of being advantageous, to bring benefit, something that's good for you. And Paul says, look, sin is never that. Sin is never good for you. It's never helpful. Sin is not to your advantage. In fact, just the opposite. The reason why God gives us rules for living is because he wants us to live right and appropriate. Not only that, he knows what's best for us. And so he says, sin is not helpful. Sin is not good. Sin never brings profit. Sin always brings loss. Now, we know the sin that he has in view here is, our Bible says, sexual immorality. And I want to take you back to the Greek word. The Greek word is actually the word pornea. It is the word from which we get our our word pornography, but it's much broader than that. This word pornea actually includes anything of a sexual nature that's wrong. And so it it can be translated unchastity or immorality or fornication. It, It certainly includes sex outside of marriage. It includes pornography and affairs. But it also includes lustful thoughts and anything else that cheapens or redefines what God has created sex to be. Now, I want you to read that last phrase again. In our day, have people tried to redefine things, especially things of a sexual nature? I want to say that's unchastity. Man does not have the right to redefine what God himself has defined. And Paul says this, you need to realize the reason why God says it's not good is because it's harmful. That's not how you're supposed to live. And Paul says, don't say it's good when actually it's not good. Sexual sin is a source of all kinds of problems. I want you to think about the destructive nature of sexual sin. And we could come up with a list much greater than this, but you know these things are true. First of all, sexual sin It destroys marriages and relationships. Is that true or not? Of course it is. We've all seen it. There's probably not any of us here that are not affected in some way by someone in our family or friends or maybe in your own personal life that know this is true. Sexual sins, they destroy marriages and they destroy relationships. They ruin families. It's harmful. It shatters homes. Is that true or not true? Of course it's true. We know it's true. It causes heartache. It causes disease. It causes financial disaster. Sexual sin destroys more lives than alcohol and drugs combined, and yet we live in a culture that says, oh, it's good. Don't don't tell us what to do. And I want to suggest to you, Paul is saying sexual sin outside of marriage, sexual sin, it's harmful. It will destroy you. And we should know that, although we want to make excuses about it. It is destructive Sexual sin not only is destructive to lives and relationships, but it's also the source of all kinds of other sin. Just think about this. When people are involved in that, it's the source of lying, cheating, and stealing. Yes? No? Lying, cheating, and stealing sounds like a country western song. It's also the cause of bitterness and hatred and slander and gossip. It's the source of unforgiveness and in some cases even murder. If not physical murder, certainly murder in our hearts. We're going to kill somebody else because of what they've done. And we realize this is not good, and Paul points that out clearly. Sin, sexual sin, is harmful. And Paul's point is simply this. It harms everyone involved. There's not innocent bystanders, and it goes beyond those who are immediately involved. And so those people who say, well, we're not hurting anyone, I've got to stop and say that's bunk, and we know it's true. Sexual sin causes all kinds of harm. It destroys relationships, and it has long, far-reaching consequences. And again, I've got to stop and say, we know that because every one of us here 
knows of a situation where we've seen that been played out, if not in our own lives, in the lives of somebody close to us. And Paul simply says, you need to realize it's harmful. He goes on, however, not only is it harmful, he tells us sexual sin is also controlling. And again, he uses this phrase that was popular in that day, all things are lawful for me. But he says, personally, I will not be dominated by anything. And his argument is, I'm not going to let anything have mastery over me. Paul refuses to be mastered by anything. And so that word dominated, we understand that. We understand that word dominated means to be under the influence or controlled by something else or someone else. And Paul says, as for me, I won't let anything dominate me. Paul won't be mastered. And I want to suggest to you, no Christian should be controlled by what culture dictates. We shouldn't let culture define us. We shouldn't let culture tell us what's right and wrong. See, Christians, Jesus Christ is our Lord and Master. We're not going to be mastered by anything else. And I want to tell you this, and again, you know this is true. You know it's true. No sin is more enslaving than sexual sin. Here's the nature of sexual sin. The more it's indulged, the more, the, the more it c- controls a person. Sexual sin always escalates. It's one of those sins that, well, you start out small, and you need a little bit more to satisfy, and a little bit more to satisfy, and a little bit more, and it is controlling. It's the law of of diminishing returns. And when it comes to this sin, we become callous, and we become emboldened, and it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And Paul's point is, you shouldn't let anything like that control you. As Christians, We want to say, Jesus Christ controls our life. And as Christians, we should say, we're going to be in control of our own bodies. And as Christians, we actually should stop and say, what we want to do is become what God wants us to be. We won't be controlled by anybody or anything except Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Now, Paul writes about this elsewhere. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says this. Here's what God's plan for you is. For this is the will of God. Have you ever asked the question, I wonder what God's will is? Well, here it is. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. If you want to know what God wants for you, I can say for sure, right out of Scripture, God wants you to be sexually pure. God wants you not to be involved in sexual immorality. And that's what Paul is saying here. This is the will of God. You need to understand that sin is harmful. That's why it's a sin. And sin actually is controlling, especially sexual sin. And what God wants is you to become everything he designed you to be, which is actually his next point. You see, sin is not only harmful and sin is not only controlling, sin is disruptive. And what I mean by that is it prevents you from becoming what God wants you to be. And as we go through our passage, Paul says this, the body's not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. And Paul's going to go on and say, this is what God wants for you. God wants you to become everything he designed you to be. God wants you to live a happy, holy life. God wants you to be free from all kinds of problems that result from this. What God wants from you is to live life and live life abundantly. You see, again, God is not a cosmic killjoy. He's not trying to take fun out of life. Actually, God wants you to live a life of peace and happiness. God wants you to live a life where you're free from all kinds of, well, from all kinds of shadows and, and all kinds of ghosts of the past, all kinds of scars and suffering. And actually, there are many, many people here can testify. I want to tell you those things that we indulged in, they continue to haunt us. And God wants to keep you free from that kind of life. You see, God wants you to become everything he designed you to be. And here's the lie that we've been told. Oh, it's okay, we can do what we want. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's our own life, we can do what we please. It makes us happy, and so why shouldn't we do this? And I want to stop and say, actually, you're fooling yourself because by living that kind of lifestyle, you're actually poisoning yourself. Sin's disruptive. It prevents you from becoming what God wants you to be. God designed you. He he knows what's good for you. He wants you to reach your full potential. And again, one more time, God is not this cosmic killjoy who wants to take the fun out of life. God cares about you. God cares about your body. That's the reason why he gives these instructions. In fact, the truth of the matter is, and you know this too, but nobody else is going to say it, so let me, sexual sin affects you in such a way there's no other sin that's more destructive than this type of sin. Let me show you some of sin's 
effects, if, if I, I can. Well, interesting first. Let me go back and, and catch that. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. That's interesting. Every other sin is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. What, what does that mean? Well, commentaries, they're all over the place on this. And there are a lot of commentaries will point out this, that other kinds of sins, they don't really affect you personally in this sense. If you're involved in sexual sin, it causes all kinds of disease, and we know that's true. Things like AIDS and syphilis and gonorrhea. And so some people say that's what's going on here with this, this passage. Every other sin is outside the body, but this might affect your own body. And while that's true, I'm not sure that's exactly what's going on. In fact, let me say that's not exactly what's going on here. Uh, at its core... Here's what Paul is saying. Sexual sin affects the body more clearly than any other type of sin. And so here's where I wanted to go with the sexual sin, how it affects you. Sexual sins of all types, they affect you, first of all, and you know it's true. Sexual sin affects a person's self-worth. Now, let me just ask you, is that true or not true? It's absolutely true. And God doesn't want you to have to fall prey for that. Sexual sin uh, affects you personally in a way that no other sin does. But it goes beyond that. Sexual sins, they affect your relationship with other people. Do I need to ask you, is that true or not? Of course it's true. It destroys lives and relationships. You see, other sins, they're out there, but this one affects you in a way that no other sin does. And the same thing's true of this. Sexual sin affects people's relationship with God. In fact, it's hard to, to say, I'm going to give my life to Jesus and follow and become more like him, while at the same time you're being tempted and led into this area of sin in your life. In fact, let me say it's impossible. Sexual sin violates the very sacredness of your body. And so Paul tells us, look, don't, get, don't go there. Don't get involved. Don't do that. It, it is very effective. It'll affect your body in very negative ways. Well, at this point, Paul's going to boil down the whole passage into two very concise statements and then give us two commands. And I just want you to notice this. In fact, if you have your Bibles, I would underline this because he's going to stop and say, here's the point, here's what I'm trying to do. Here, here's the statements, reminders. The first reminder is this. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have from God. Just think about that for a moment as Christians. The Holy Spirit lives within us. And are you really going to say, okay, I'm going to be involved in this kind of sin and have the Holy Spirit living in my life and dwelling within me? Seriously? It gives a second reminder. You were bought with a price. Do you realize how much God loved you? God loved you so much he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you. Jesus Christ came willingly and gave his life for you to redeem you, to purchase you, to buy you back, and so you could live life as he intended. And really you're going to say, oh, forget you, Jesus. I know you bought me and purchased me, but... I no longer want to live for you. And so he gives us those clear reminders. And then on the heel of those reminders, he comes and gives us two very clear commands. Now, when I say the word command, these aren't suggestions. Here's the first command. Flee from sexual immorality. He doesn't say it this way, be cautious or create boundaries or tread carefully or, you know, you can go a certain distance, but don't go too far. He doesn't say that. What he says is, run. Now, I like this, that word flee. If you take the Old Testament, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the very same word in the Greek translation of the Old Testament is used in the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Do you remember that story? Joseph is in a, a household servant, and Potiphar, the one he's serving, his wife comes on to Joseph. You remember the story, right? And as she makes her advances, do you remember what Joseph does? He runs. I'm going to tell you, that's the appropriate response. Don't come close. Don't tread carefully. Flee from sexual immorality. You should have no hint of this in the life of a Christian. And then he gives this second command. The second command is this. He says, glorify God in your body. Do I need to ask this question? When you're involved in sexual sin, are you glorifying God with your body? Of course, the answer is no. Now, let me just stop and remind you, God created sex. Sex is a wonderful thing in, in, in marriage, in the life of the Christian. But sexual immorality causes great harm. And what God wants for you is what's best 
for you. And so these commands flee sexual immorality and glorify God in your body. I wish I had time to go through every phrase in this passage. But if I did, I could come up with many reasons that Paul gives to flee sexual morality, the dangers of sexual sin. I'm just going to give you eight. There's more than this. And I challenge you to actually go back and read this passage. You can come up with more than this. But at least these, and maybe go back and underline these in your, pass, in your passage. But here's some reasons. Here's eight of them. He tells us and starts this way. It's not helpful to you. It's not helpful to church or anyone around you. It has long-reaching, lasting consequences, and so don't do it. He says, we're not to be dominated by anything. We're supposed to let Jesus Christ be our master. Our bodies were not meant for immorality. Our bodies actually will one day be resurrected. Our bodies are members of Christ's body. And you're going to take Christ's body and unite that with a prostitute? Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Our bodies are not our own. We were bought with a price, the death of Jesus Christ. And we are meant to glorify God with our bodies. And so, so Paul says, flee from it. Don't do it. Don't even go there. And it gives us these reasons because God actually wants what's best for you. He wants you to live a life that's free from guilt and sin and scars and stains and ghosts of the past. God actually knows what's best for you and wants what's best for you. As I read through this passage, I know that I've made some of you uncomfortable, but I also want to suggest There's no one else in society that's going to preach God's truth like this. As a church, we've got to stand up and say there is such a thing as right and wrong. And I know some of you, maybe even many of you, statistics would say maybe all of us have struggled in some area in this regard. Or certainly we know families that have been ruined by this. And so we've all struggled in some sense with this area. And I want to stop, and I I said this from the start, my, my, my hope is not to make you uncomfortable or make you squirm. That's not my intent. But I do love you enough to say, here's what's best for you, because God loves us enough to tell us how we're supposed to live. And what I really want to do is I want to take you back, and I want to put this whole passage in context. You see, we've read verses 12 through 20, and it'd be a disservice not to go back and show you the context. And so I want to take you back, and I want to take you back to verse 9. Remember, he's writing to Corinth, to a church, well, even the church was Corinthianizing They were involved in all kinds of sexual sin, and they were making excuses. But Paul says to them, or don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, the greedy, nor drunkards, or revilers, or swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Here's what I want to take you to. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Here is the great news of the gospel message. Jesus Christ died for you to change you. So no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've been involved in, no matter what your past has been like, no matter those scars or hurts or stains, no matter what you've done in the past, Jesus Christ came, he died for you to wash you and cleanse you and help you become what God intended you to be. So no matter who you are or what you've done, here's the gospel message. Jesus Christ loves you. And he wants to take you and make you into a new man or a new woman. He wants to offer you forgiveness. And life going forward can be much different than the life of the past. That's great news. Going forward, what will we do with Jesus? Going forward, what kind of commitments will we make? Moving forward from this point, will we really live a life that's not only honoring to God, but helps us become what God intends us to be? And that's where Paul wants to take us. And so he says, flee sexual immorality because it's dangerous, it's harmful, it's controlling, it's disruptive. It'll ruin you. And so let me just say, thank God for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that offers forgiveness to everyone. Amen? We've put communion off to the very end for this purpose. Jesus Christ actually came to cleanse us to forgive us of all unrighteousness. And as we take communion, I want you to to really, first of all, I want you to stop and say, thank you, Jesus, for taking the consequence, the brunt of our sin. Thank you for becoming sin for us. And I want you to stop and say, Jesus Christ, I am so thankful that you have given your life for me 
to forgive me for my sins. And I also want you to stop and examine your life. It's what we're supposed to do in communion. Examine your life and say, I want to give my life to you because I know that you have my best interest in mind. And so not only a thankfulness for what he has done, but a pledge of commitment and obedience to become what he wants us to be. We're going to serve communion. If you've not been with us before, we're going to pass communion. We've got a stack of cups. And the bottom is the bread. The top is the juice, representing his body and his blood. And the reminder that Jesus Christ doesn't want to leave us where we are. He wants to call us forward to become what he intends us to be. Would you pray with me? Father, we want to come before you and thank you for loving us, loving us enough to give us rules and guidelines for living, loving us enough to, real, uh, to, to give us instructions about what is harmful and hurtful for our bodies, and giving us instructions about how to live in a way that we can be free from those, uh, those sins, those scars, those stains. And so, Father, right now we want to come to you and say thank you for Jesus, who, well, he, he purchased our forgiveness so we can be cleansed, so we can be redeemed. And Father, at this moment right now as we move forward, help us become everything you designed us, intended us to be. And that's my prayer. And we pray this in the blessed name of our Lord, our Savior, our forgiver. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.